So we're just having a little look in this window this morning and we can see that the bees are still hungry here in the apiary. There hasn't been much flowering and it's really quite location specific because about five kilometres from here is where I live and there is some things flowering there and the bees are starting to bring in nectar which is great. But here you can clearly see the bees aren't bringing in nectar. You can see that the honeycomb has a pattern where the bees have eaten the honey away. They've actually uncapped it, taken their wax capping off and eaten the honey because that's what the bees need and that's why they store honey so they can survive times where there's no flowers. So we're here doing our weekly Q&A so if you've got questions put it in the comments below. Also quite interested to know whether you're new to the Facebook live stream or whether you're a regular. If you could put that in the comments that'd be really interesting for us to know whether, you, uh, whether you've watched it before or whether you're, this is your first time. What we're also going to be doing is just doing some maintenance on this hive here and, and uh, having a look at the beetle trap in the bottom of the hive. So let's have a look at that now. So while you're thinking of questions we'll just do this and pull out the tray at the bottom. So this is the pest management tray and it gets quite gunky in here if you haven't had a look at it for a number of months. You can see here there's a beetle, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one over here. So what happens is the bees chase those small hive beetles down through the screen at the bottom, there's a screen bottom board, and they, uh, once they get oil on them, they then will die in the oil. And that's important if your hive's a bit weak. So the hives are a bit weak at the moment, when you get sustained months without nectar, the bees will actually reduce in numbers. And when they reduce in numbers, it means there's not enough bees to really look after all the surface areas of all the combs. And that's a time when those little hive beetles can take hold. One beetle can lay thousands of eggs if the bees aren't there to keep it all under check. And those beetle larvae end up making a real mess of your brood combs in the bottom box here. So um, good idea if your hive's low in numbers to trap some beetles in the bottom if you've got the small hive beetle in your area. So what I'm going to do is take out this tray and we'll clean that one but I have one here that I prepared earlier. And I'll just show you how to trap those beetles. All we need to do is get some cooking oil. So this is just some regular cooking oil from the shops. If you've um, done some deep frying and you've got some leftover cooking oil, you can also use that. It's said that if the vegetable oil has been used, it's even more attractive for those beetles. They, they're a beetle that, that does like a bit of, uh, bit of vegetable matter. They tend to get into your compost heap. In my compost at home, there's lots and lots of the small hive beetles. They're, um, they're normal. They're all over the world, not in all places, but in a lot of places. I tend to use cooking oil from the chip shop because I run my car on the old fish and chip oil, so I've got plenty of that around. But all you need to do is fill up each one of these. Now we've put baffles in the tray just so that if there's a bit of a slope, and we have counter sloped the way this tray sits to, because the hive does have a backward tilt for the honey harvesting, We'll put a counter slope on the rails, but nevertheless, if it's on a bit of a slope, these baffles will help the oil be on all of the surfaces. It's like an ice cube tray. So um, it, all you need to do is cover it. You don't need to, to make it really thick in there. Then it's a case of just sliding that into this area here. and we'll trap some more beetles. If your hive was really busy and there was a lot of bees at the front of the entrance and perhaps curling around underneath, you might need to look under there and make sure there's not a whole lot of bees on the screen when you push that in or they'll get stuck in there. But because it's so quiet, it's early in the morning, there's not bees all over the front of the entrance, 
then I'm confident there's no bees underneath there when I put my tray in. Then I can choose the ventilation option by putting the vents upwards if I want more. But it's quite cool here now, we're getting a lot of cool nights. It's our winter, so I'll put the vents down. This section here comes in contact with that handle and limits ventilation up under the screen. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments and Trace, you might have gotten on the phone and uh, <laughs> Trace will More read right. out those questions for you. So there's our lovely Trace that many of you would have phoned up to, to get your questions answered and she's going to read out your questions. Okay, so if you've got any, oh. put them in the comments. Sorry, I was so busy there, Cedar. Um, people shouting out from Fiji, Hawaii, all over the place. Peter Cox, our ambassador, has joined us this morning. Um, Greg's asked, asking, they caught a swarm the other day and they have the queen, but she's not laying. Uh, they placed a frame of brood and the bees on the frame in the hive to help them. Was it a mistake to leave the bees on the frame? Uh, there's different schools of thought about that. So, so that's a question of introducing two bees from different hives together. So sometimes you can get a situation where the bees will actually fight. And I've, I definitely have seen that where you introduce bees from one hive to another hive, let's say you've moved a frame from over here, there's lots of bees all over it, you put it in this hive and this fight breaks out and you can actually watch them have these tussles and they roll at the entrance and, and um, try and rip each other's wings off and things. Other times nothing much happens. So that really, really depends. Some people don't worry about it and they'll just mix up bees willy nilly and, and um, it works for them. Others will make sure when they are putting bees from one hive into another, they'll go through a merging technique where they, they separate it with a layer of newspaper and the bees slowly chew that away. And meanwhile, they get used to the scent from each colony and then they can mix fine. So i um, not sure whether it's caused an issue or not, but what I would say in your situation is just wait a bit longer. I'm not sure how long it's been for you, but sometimes it can just take a little while for the queen to, to be laying, especially if it's a new swarm in a box. Um, but if it's been some time and there's still no sign of any eggs or larvae, then, then you may need to introduce a new queen or do what you've already done and introduce a coma brood from another hive that has eggs on it so they can raise their own queen from that. Now, um, you might choose to brush off the bees off that comb from the other hive next time. And that way you won't get any fighting between the two colonies. Tiffany's asking Cedar, just to follow up on that tray um, that you mentioned before, she's in there in Missouri. They removed the tray due, due to a pretty hot climate, uh, due to bedding. Should they put the tray back in occasionally in the hot climates to trap those beetles or just leave the tray out? So generally, if the hive's got a lot of bees, this hive doesn't. There's quite a few flying this morning, which is nice to see. And there's a bit of pollen coming in. But if we open the side windows here, there's actually not a whole lot going on. There's almost nothing happening in the top box here at the moment, simply because we put the super on and then no flowers happened. So you're not going to get anything happening unless you've got sustained flowers for a while, enough for the bees to building up again and increasing the numbers in order to populate this top box and storing, storing the honey. So um, in terms of uh, trapping beetles, it, I wouldn't bother if you open the windows and you see a lot of bees, I wouldn't bother about trapping beetles. Your colony is big enough to defend itself. That's, that's my technique, I only bother catching beetles when the hive is weak. Um, and that works for me. If, as far as ventilation goes, if it is hot, you've got a lot of bees bearding and the colony is strong, then by all means take the tray right out. Allow maximum ventilation up into the hive and um, that, that could assist them. Having said that, bees are very good at air conditioning themselves and even if you close off the ventilation, they will make do with ventilating from the front. 
A lot of hives in the world have no screen bottom board and they do just fine. Great. Luca um, keep, he's, keeps asking, he's wanting to know, will we ever make a more affordable hive and also what makes the flow hives expensive? Okay, good question. So we do have a more affordable option, which is called the hybrid and it might be out of stock at the moment in your area. We'll check in on that. But we did that to make it more affordable for those who, who can't afford this model, which is the Western Red Cedar six frame. So what we did is we made less flow frames in the center of the hive. And so, so for this size box, there'll be three flow frames here and two conventional frames either side. And there's also a choice of wood type. This Western Red Cedar is the more expensive wood and the uh, We've also got the Australian Aracaria, which is more affordable, and also the um, Polonia. So this, we've got three wood options, and um, the hybrid will definitely be your affordable option, so look out for that. In terms of um, manufacturing, you would think that, um, that you could make it all um, really cheaply I guess but the answer is after doing it for a number of years now we're really trying we're finding it hard to reduce the cost any further than we have and it's actually uh, to the point where a super a j just sorry just a brood box we're actually selling them for less than we're making them which is not a very good business move but we're like we can't charge any more for a regular box just a single box so um, we're right down below the wire on that one, which is crazy, but um, we just want to make sure we're looking after our customers and making them extra boxes, even if it's costing us money to do so. Um, we're made in Australia, so this is all laser cut right here, and the, the uh, flow frames are injection molded in Australia as well. So um, uh, while... Um, we can compete with other countries. There, there could be a factor there. There's certainly people in the world who do manage to do manufacturing cheaper, but whether or not the quality is there is, um, is always a question mark. Right. Maybe I'll also mention cedar that in some countries as well we do do scratch and dent hives, so that's a little bit more affordable as well. Yes, thanks um, Trace. No probs. A um, couple of people asking about um, cleaning their um, flow frames. Do they need to clean them if they're getting a bit gummed up? So the answer is the, if they're in the hive, the bees will look after them. They do a great job of looking after the frames when they're in the hive. It's when you have them outside the hive and you've left them around and perhaps you're in a humid climate and they've gone a bit mouldy or the vermin's gotten onto them then you might need to clean them with some hot water. So try and get a hot hose, connect up to your laundry tap, give them a really good hose down, and then let the bees do the rest of the work. Or if you've got a gurney, you can gurney them and spray off uh, any build up on them there. But if they've been left on the hive, they should be fine and, and not need cleaning, aside from the trough at the bottom here. So if you have a look in this window, there's a, a trough at the bottom and sometimes this area down the bottom here, if I pull out that cap, some honey build up as if the bees don't seal all of the frame parts together then you can get some honey dribbling into that area. Also after you've harvested then you might put the cap back in and um, the last remaining bits we've designed this little leak back point to drain the last bits of honey back into the hive but after some time bees will be bees and they'll block up that little point here and we've designed it so each time you put the tube in it automatically unblocks it for you so you don't have to think about that but but after some time the piece will inevitably block that up if you see a bit of build up there then it's a good idea to unblock that point sometimes you can do that by just turning this cap around and that will break the seal and the bees will be able to uh, lick up any honey that's built up in that trough area but if it's been some time and it's been sitting there and you're in a humid climate, sometimes you can get some fermentation of a little bit of honey that's built up in this trough area. 
And if you're in a cold climate, you could also get some honey candying in this area. So there could be two reasons there why you might want to clean out that area. You can get a, a wet cloth and put it on your flow key and poke it in here and give it a bit of a clean before you harvest. I very rarely have to do that. Most of the time it's fine. If, you're, um, if you really want to give it a wash, then the way you do that is you can put a, um, a tube in there and then put the hose in there, but don't fill it up too much. You don't want water spilling into the hive. You just want to swish some water in and let it run out. Swish some water in and let it run out. And if that was warm water, all the better. And that could rinse out that area down there. Generally, I don't have to do that. Generally, there's no maintenance for cleaning the flow frames. See, there's some people might have noticed that there is some wax on the outer frame here behind the window. Can you tell us more about why you might have intentionally put wax on the frames? Uh, on this one, on the side. So, so that was a um, experiment to show how if you're getting a little impatient and the bees are taking a while, like this hive is, the reason why they're taking a while is there is no nectar and there's not enough bees really to work this box. And interestingly enough, the first time we showed that, we put a blob of wax there on the frame. We just simply scraped some wax off the top of the brood frames, put it there. And you can see that the bees, if you zoom in right on this bit here, you can see that the bees actually quickly recycled that wax and started to, to join the cell parts together. And, but the next time we did it, the colony had actually shrunk down, the numbers had dropped, and they're not even working the top box at all now and they haven't actually touched the bit we put there. So you won't get any action in the top box until there's enough bees and there's a, a strong nectar flow. When you start seeing a lot of bees in the window, that's when you start to see them joining all of the flow frame parts together, coating them all in wax, and then they'll start storing their nectar and away they go. So those blobs of wax were simply to show you that technique. In Ian's asking Cedar, uh, do you remove the queen excluder in winter? And if you do, then how do you get the queen to move back down to the brood box in spring? Okay, so the answer is no. In this climate, we don't get a long, cold winter like in other parts of the world. If you're in an area that gets a long, cold winter and snow, etc., then you may need to remove the queen excluder if you plan to leave the flow super on during winter. And the reason being is as the ball of bees hunkers down for the winter in, in a cluster, they'll move up to eat the honey in the top box. And if the queen can't get through the excluder because she's too big, she'll be left behind and could perish from the cold. So generally beekeepers in those cold regions will remove excluders for the winter time. Now how you get the bees back down come spring is you simply uh, take your frames out, shake the bees off into the bottom box, put your excluder back in place and put your frames back in again. And that'll ensure all the bees are below the excluder and then the, the bees will come back up to the excluder to work the frames but the queen will be in the bottom box because she can't get through it. So. Um, that could be an important thing. Ask your local beekeepers what they do, whether it's cold enough for you to worry about that in your region. Here we're in a subtropical region. This is our winter and it's not so cold. They get plenty of nectar. Um, well, hopefully plenty of nectar in the winter time. Usually they do. So we don't need to worry about that at all. Cedar Allison's asking, she's in Sydney, um, she's about to start assembling her cedar flow hive this weekend, just wondering what parts and edges do they need to paint with the tongue oil and how long should they leave it to dry before they put their bees in there? Okay, good question. <laughs> so generally what we do here is just coat the outside. If you've got a cedar hive, it's easier to keep looking this natural wood colour than it is the other wood types. Other wood types will tend to attract the mildew quite quickly and the cedar has natural repelling properties. So if you do want this beautiful wooden look, then the cedar is the hive for you. Now, 
We tend to just coat the outside and leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees, but it's up to you. The bees won't mind if you coat the inside as well. Um, unless you're installing a swarm for the first time. If they're an established colony and you put them in from say a nuke box, then um, they won't go anywhere because they've got their brood to look after. Um, so the inside, I'll just explain what conventional beekeepers do, which might, um, might uh, provide some, some insights into what you can and can't do with a bee box. So normally, in a conventional fashion, beekeepers want their wooden ware to last a very long time, and they're usually using a, um, a, a, as cheap as they can get, pine box. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll dip it in, in uh, chemicals, and they'll soak it in there. It's like the chemicals that they treat pine with. And then they'll put several coats of exterior house paint inside and out on that box. And they can make that, that um, quite cheap pine box last for 20 years by doing that. However, um, I tend to steer away from those chemicals and prefer just to leave it natural on the inside. Cedar is a long lasting wood as it is, so it has natural properties to resist rot and so on. And I would just leave it naked on the inside. However, if you want to paint it inside and out, you can and your bees will be okay. The um, exception is I will paint inside and out on the doors because the bees aren't in contact with those areas and the, the moisture when it rains will be getting on both sides of this so nice to have it coated both sides. Same with these windows on the side. Right. Cedar, what about um, hot, hot wax dipping? So I haven't had, um, personally, we have tried some hot wax dipping and for me the finish wasn't that desirable, it didn't work that well, but if you've got an example of hot wax dipping that's worked out well and looks great, then by all means uh, uh, let us know what it's like. We have had some issues, one came in recently, but we actually haven't heard of this before, so it might not be an issue. Somebody did some hot wax dipping and found that they got some splits forming in their woodenware. So something to be aware of if you plan to hot wax dip, you may get some splits forming in your wood. Uh, loving this question from Colin, asking is it possible to, for a new beekeeper beekeeper just to stick to one hive or does everyone eventually end up squeezing hives into their garden like Tetris blocks? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, it certainly is possible to just keep it to one hive. What you'll find in the springtime is your bees will naturally want to expand and there's ways to limit that. You can go through spring management and you can get into your brood box and put some new brood frames uh, and take away some of the ones that just have honey on the outside and or if you're using naturally drawn comb you can simply cut out some honeycomb and put those frames straight back in the center and that will relieve that swarming tendency because the queen has lots of new fresh area to lay in. The other thing you could do is add another brood box or, or another super and that will create a bigger hive space and that will limit the the uh, natural tendency for them to divide and make a new colony. Um, or the best one is take a split in spring and you could pr probably find somebody who will come and do that because they want to, to uh, get the split and that way, that way you, you're, you're, you've helped somebody else and also limited your colony from naturally expanding or swarming. The, um, so th that way you can just maintain one hive in your yard. It's quite possible a lot of people do do that. However, what you will probably find is you'll go, wow, this one hive is working great. Why don't we get another one? And when you have another hive, you also increase the chances of getting uh, a really uh, nice amount of honey because sometimes you'll find there's a great nectar flow, but your colony wasn't quite ready for it, didn't build up in time, and, and your bees didn't take advantage of the honey flow when it was there. When you've got multiple hives, you'll find that some will do great, some won't, and having more hives will actually 
help you by um, by having some strong ones when there's a good honey flow and also if you get a weak uh, hive say let's say it loses its queen you could use the resources from another hive by putting a frame with eggs on it into the hive that's lost their queen and get it going again so I'd always recommend having a, a second hive or a number of hives but if you've only got space for one then one's better than none. Right. Seed, I don't know if you're able to do this, but Heidi's wondering if you could show us a flow frame, what it looks like when it's open and closed. Um, she's worried that her frames look open, but she thinks they're closed. Sure. I don't know if you're able to. There's a okay. key behind Here we go. it. Yeah. Here's a key. So what we'll do is um, actually take a frame out of the top of this hive. There's really not many bees in the top box, so I can probably do it with no bee suit on. And we'll see how that goes. So I'm just undoing the little wing screws here. And I'm taking the top off. Oh, looks like the inner cover's coming with it. There we go. And I can see a beetle. Um, there's a couple of bees here starting to work these centre ones. So if I take out this and lift up one of these frames. So the bees have already stuck it down. Now if I had my J tool, I'll put it under the end here. But because I don't, I'll just use this flow key to give it a little, little lever up. We'll see if we can get it lifting. Okay. Might even leave that on. Normally I'd take that off, but I don't want the bees to be coming out just yet. Now we're lifting up that frame. You can see here the bees have started to, to connect all those cells together. They're chasing a few beetles around, so it's good we've got that beetle trap happening. And I'll just show you how that frame works. So what you should see, and because there's gaps for the bee's knees and wings here, it's actually a bit strange when you move it on angles. It looks like it's lined up, then not lined up. So the way to tell whether it's lined up is you're looking straight down the cell line as if you've dropped a hexagonal pencil down the, the cell, you want to look in that line. And to the camera, because it fish eyes a little bit, if you look in the centre of the lens now, you should see that the cells are lined up in this area here. So that's when they're in the right position. I'll show you what it looks like when they're out of line. I'll just pull that cap out. And I'm going to put this key in the bottom here. Now if you're new to beekeeping make sure you're wearing your bee suit if you're doing anything like this. Okay now on this edge here only I'm going to open the cells. So you can see there they're clearly in the zigzag shape and next to it they are lined up in the center there. So you can see the first first one two three cell lines uh, are out of line in the harvesting mode and the rest are in line. So I hope that helps you. Another way to tell from the outside is by looking down this area at the top. So if you're concerned that some are up, then you can put your key in the top and just turn it and that'll push the cells back down again. So by doing that, we know that they're all lined up. And if you look down here, you should see that it's flat all the way down to the back of the frame. You can also run the key down there and sort of feel whether there's any sticking up. You should be able to get all the way into there. There's just three fingers from the frame and that's the back of the frame. So we're all the way to the back and they're all lined up.
Cedar, if you're resetting a frame that has a lot of wax on it, will you need to leave the key in for longer? So if you've gotten into the situation where, where some of the frame, and, and I've seen this, I saw this in a hive recently I was looking at on the weekend, the, uh, the key, when the person had reset the frame, wasn't all the way to the back. And what that meant is just this last piece of the frame was still in open mode. If it's left in that open mode for a long time, I'm just going to put this back because the bees have noticed there's something going on. If it's left in that open mode for a long time, the bees will actually put a whole lot of wax on that area and the frame parts may not be able to close. So a way you can fix that is leave the key in the top for some time, even days, and hopefully with the heat of the day, those frame parts will just move back into the position they're supposed to be in. If you want to uh, check that out, you could take the frame out, leave a key in the top, and just leave it in the sun, nice hot sun, and you'll notice those pieces will sink back into their correct position. Having said that, you don't want to leave the frames in the sun for a long time because it will damage the uh, plastic. So flow frames should be kept in the dark like they are in a hive. Right, awesome. Um, thanks Heidi's rep for that and awesome camera work there Jai on those flow frames. Pretty happy. <laughs> okay, here's a question. Um, Raylene's wanting to know, is it possible that an existing colony might swarm from an empty hive um, might swarm out of one hive and then go to an empty hive? So, uh, yes, it can happen. So um, if they've swarmed, it means they've left some bees behind. So half the bees and the old queen will leave and they're looking for a new home. So some people will set up what's called a bait hive. And it works quite well where you've got a lot of hives like this and you can set up a bait hive a couple of hundred meters out that way, six to 12 feet off the ground is the ideal. A box about the size of a brood box and some people put scents in there to attract the bees and so on. It's, um, it's uh, some people put an old comb, an old brood, brood comb in there to attract the bees and I've had it work quite well and I've also had it fail a lot as well so it's a bit hit and miss but it's one way you can get bees into a hive, if, especially if you've got an apiary of 100 hives by a commercial beekeeper. If you set up some bait hives, you've got a really good chance of getting a colony into your bait hive. It, there's a uh, product called Swarm Commander. I've never used it, but some people say that it works quite well to uh, attract the, the, the new swarm. Other people get some lemongrass oil and put it in a little Ziploc bag, put a pinhole in that, and that is said to, to have a similar pheromone to help attract the swarm. So by all means experiment with a bait hive. If you're just setting up your hive in your backyard and hoping bees will come, then they probably won't unless you're nearby a bunch of other hives. <laughs> Great, Leanne uh, is a newbie and they've, they've got a rural property and they're really, they're so excited, they've just got their hive. Just wondering, is it better, do you think, um, that they set the hive up close so they can keep an eye on it, but then they'll need to move it in the future, or should they just put it where they want to keep it and just check it, you know, not, it won't be so close to the house? Okay, so the answer to that is um, you'll need to consider what you need to do to move a hive. So if you want to set it up close for a while and you do plan to move it, then there's a couple of options and we've got a few videos showing you how to move your hives and we've got more extensive videos in the, our beekeeping course called thebeekeeper.org. So if you uh, plan to move the hive, then the, what you've got to consider is the geolocating of the bees. If you have a colony here, we move this hive more than about a metre and a half, two metres away 
let's say we moved it five meters away, all the returning forages will come back to this spot. And that way you'll get a loss of a lot of bees from that hive. They'll eventually move into the hive next door if you've got a lot of hive, hives. But um, if you don't, you'll end up losing a bunch of bees or they might even set up a temporary little home on a log here and start even building wax. The, um, so in order to get the bees to come with you, there's a couple of techniques to, to reorientate your bees. One is to move it, um, say, more than say, six kilometers, four, five miles away. Keep it there for three or four weeks and then move it back to the position, the new position. And that way it gives enough time for all those foragers to forget where they were because they've cycled out and there's not many of the original foragers left by the time you move it back. The other technique is a disorientation technique where you put, where you move the hive to where you want it. Let's say it's just a few hundred meters over there. And in front of the hive, you put a, an obstacle. You can snap some branches off a tree. You can taper an old shirt across the hive and just make sure this, it's kind of a bit hard for them to get out of their entrance. And all of a sudden, they're like, something's changed, something's different. And that will trigger most of the bees to reorientate. You still get some returning to the old spot, but not nearly as many as you would if you just picked up the hive and moved it. So I use that technique. It's a lot easier than moving it far away and then back again. You simply put the hive where you want it and, and put a whole lot of debris in front of the hive Bees will come racing out, all enthusiastic. They'll run into the, the obstacles in front and go, what's different? Something's changed. It's time to reorientate. And you'll see them doing their orientation flight as they geolocate to the new location. So consider that before you decide to set up a temporary location. <laughs> Great. Cedar, um, shout out. Fred Dunn's joined us and he's answering lots of questions as well. Ah, uh, fantastic. It's great to see the community really pitching in and helping answer other people's questions. If you know the answer to somebody's question, by all means jump in there and have a go at answering it. It's really a, a fantastic that the beekeeping community tends to help each other and that's the way we can all learn together. I'm certainly learning a lot and uh, I'm still learning a lot every week that we get out there beekeeping and also from all of you out there so fantastic and thank thank you fred for jumping in there fred's one of our um, experts who's on the beekeeper.org course if you haven't seen that it's free to try you can get in there and have a look and what we've done is we've included experts from all over the world in in beekeeping so that we've got a, a really broad range of knowledge for all of the different conditions in the world and we've put them in a nice sequential order. If you're just getting started in beekeeping, it could be a nice way for you to get started and um, get a bit of a handhold as you go. And there'll be live Q and A's from the experts around the world as well to help answer the questions. So if you're interested in that, have a look and hi to Peter as well, who's one of our uh, Flow Hive ambassadors here in Australia. Thank you for jumping in and helping answer. <laughs> Great. So a couple of people just asking, um, do, do people actually use two super flows on the top? Or? Sometimes. Um, none of these hives in this row have that at the moment, but we certainly have had times where we've put two Flow Hive supers on hives and it is a popular thing to do. Here I tend I tend personally to run the hive smaller and just split when they build up. That's a personal preference. Other people like to run the colonies a little bit bigger, especially if you're in the colder regions. Having a bigger hive seems to help a bit because the season tends to be compressed into a shorter season and everything flowers at in, in a small amount of time, a few months of the year. And what you'll find is the bees will build up, build up, build up to quite a big colony in those few months and you want enough space for the bees to do that. Here we have a honey flow that just kind of ebbs and flows all year round. So this size hive suits nicely. 
you'll find if you get right into the colder parts up in Canada, we've even got beekeepers that have stacked five flow supers high on their hives, which is amazing to see. My sort of concept, even though I should be telling you to buy more flow hives uh, supers, I tend to think that um, running less is better, it's less equipment to maintain, it's less cost, it's less, um, it's sort of a different mentality from conventional beekeeping is store the honey on the hive, then harvest it all in one big go because that's efficient. And with the flow hive, you can instead keep harvesting, store the honey in jars on the shelf and, um, and, and that's uh, an efficient way to do it without having to have multiple boxes as well. Some people will also run a double brood, so they put a second brood box and that's another way to um, increase the size of your hive if you want a bigger hive. Great. Clayton's asking, when you're done draining um, the, the flow frame and the honey slowly sort of keeps draining out, do you leave the bottom cap off for a while so it will drain or will the bees clean it up? Okay, now we thought a lot about this when we were inventing it uh, over a decade and what we came to is down here there's this little gap and now the bees have started to wax that little gap up. It looks like we haven't done our manufacturing quite right because this clear part uh, meets the yellow part and it doesn't quite meet and that's on purpose so there's a little gap there for any remaining honey to drain back into the hive. Now bees being bees will block up that little area and that's when um, we decided that we'd put a little tag on the tube that inserts. So the tube inserts and it unblocks that area for you so you don't have to think about it. When you've done harvesting and the streams slowed down to just a, a very fine stream, you can choose to, to go then and leave the last remaining bits for the honey, for the bees and so that area would have would have been cleaned out from the little tag on your tube but um, if not you can insert something like this into that area and unblock it and then when you put your cap in we've designed these little ridges which has just the right amount of space for the bees tongues to lick up into that area but really ants of that size can get through the cap. So um, that way when you put the cap in, you can even watch the bees' tongues licking up into that area. And the last remaining bits go back to the hive and you can walk away with your jar of honey without having to think about that. Great. Cedar, any tips or tricks for the hybrid super? So hybrid super has the conventional frames on the edge, two here, two here, and then three flow frames in the middle for the this size box, which is the eight frame Langstroth size, or four flow frames in the middle if you're matching it up with a 10 frame Langstroth size box. Now, the one tip would be, um, sometimes you'll get wonky comb on the edges, which can just be a bit of a mess to dig out when you go to harvest the honeycomb from the conventional frames on the side. So if you're using naturally drawn comb, then a tip would be put the, the new naturally drawn comb in the middle of the brood nest down here, take a couple of the outside frames that should be mainly honey and put them up in the top next to the flow frames. And that way you've got nice straight frames in the top rather than uh, wonky ones. Bees, if you're supering with naturally drawn comb, just with the comb guide, or it's also called foundationless frames, then the bees uh, may tend to start from the bottom and work up, which makes very wavy comb. If you're drawing uh, foundationless frames in the bottom, bees tend to start at the top and go down, which makes for much straighter frames. So a little tip there, move some frames up from the bottom, put it in the top. Having said that, you can try it on one side, leave, leave some uh, just, just naturally drawn combs on the other. You can experiment. In the end, you haven't got the brood up there, so if you have to dig the honeycomb out with the hive tool, it's not the end of the world. Sometimes you might have to take both frames out 
together because they've joined the two frames on the side together. So a few things for you to think about there and you'll be able to watch the side windows as they progress. Um, side window I should say our hybrid super just has a window on one of the sides. Uh, great. Lemire is asking new, another new beekeeper. Just wondering, is it, a, is it? Do you have any problems moving foundationless frames um, without the comb falling off? The answer is yes, until you get used to it. So, <laughs> so um, if you're an experienced beekeeper, what you tend to do, like I did in the beginning, is you pull out the frames, you turn it over, and if they've just started to create that beautiful arc of honey comb on the foundation, on the, on the comb guide, there is no support structure, there's no wires running through it and it can just fall out and if that's got brood on it you feel pretty terrible about that and you start getting rubber bands out to hold it back in place. So you probably only do that once before you realise when foundationless frames are new and the bees are just getting started on it, you can't tip them over like that. You must keep them in the plane where gravity will hold them straight. And you learn to hold them. If you're inspecting this side, you'll learn to lift it up instead of turn it up. And to get to the other side, probably the easiest way is just to rest it on something and swap over and have a look at the other side. Or you can do fancy swivels like this and turn it upside down. and. Um, have the frame upside down is fine but just not on its side or gravity will bend that comb out if it's not attached very well yet. After some time they will connect it to the wooden frame all the way around or at least on the sides and that will be strong enough to then tip it over if you want to. Great, another new, got a lots of new beekeepers today. Kelly's asking, she's um, been recommended to start with two flow hives instead of one and just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I would always recommend having more than one hive. It's, it's, uh, it will speed up your learning journey and increase the likelihood of you getting a, a really nice harvest. If you've got uh, a whole bunch of hives like this, then some of them will do really well, they'll bring in a lot of honey, some will be a bit weak and some might not get any honey at all in a season because the, perhaps the queen was a bit weak or they had something going on or the genetics um, wasn't there to, to really ramp them up and get them bringing in the um, honey when the nectar was dripping from the flowers. So, so um, beehives tend to go through cycles of being weaker and stronger and if you've got more hives it will increase the chance of getting that magical experience of a nice full honey box and watching that honey flow out into your jar. Great. Chris, he got a bit over, uh, they got a bit overexcited and um, put their hive out but forgot to paint or stain it because they were so excited and now they feel like they need to. Is any tips on how to do that if there's, it's actually full of bees? Yeah, okay. So as with all things, when you're new to beekeeping, make sure you protect yourself, wear your bee suits, take precautions, and also for those around you, bees do have nasty stings, and some people can be quite allergic to those stings. Having said that, um, I personally am not afraid to paint the hive with the bees in it. If you want to lock the bees in there, you can get up really early. You might need a whiff of smoke at the entrance to get them to go in and you can put some uh, steel walls nice and easy to stuff in the entrance while you paint the outside of the box or you can just wear your protective gear and uh, paint the outside of the hive while the bees are flying in and out the entrance. It gets a bit tricky where the bees are flying in and out but I actually find that's easier than taking the bees out and, uh, and going through that process of um, painting and then installing the bees again. So we've got time for a couple more questions that you might not be able to hear because we've got a helicopter flying overhead. But um, time for a couple more. Okay. All right, here's one from Tony. Just wondering, um, they've got a flow hive, but they've also got lots of native stingless bees there in um, New South Wales, Australia. Just wondering, is, is it okay? Will they just coexist or will they compete with each other? 
I haven't seen any issues. I, I've got a few of the native beehives as well, the sugar bag bee, and I haven't seen any issues. I have seen them share flowers and there doesn't seem to be any animosity between them. I've got some nice footage of them on lotus flowers together with the, uh, with the, the little black TC bees and the European honeybee going for the nectar together. So there really isn't any issue. And over here on my friend's farm, there's hundreds of, of uh, honeybee hives and there's also hundreds of the native Australian bee and they're coexisting just fine. We've actually got footage of native Australian bees kicking honeybees off flowers. Oh, have you? It's a great sight. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. So, um, so the native bees certainly will hold their own there. How far apart should the hives be? So there isn't any stipulation on how far apart your hives need to be. The, they can be banging up against each other. In fact, you'll see commercial beekeepers putting hives on pallets, four to a pallet, and they'll use a forklift to move them around. And the bees are clever enough to know which hive is theirs, even when the hives are banging up against each other. Having said that, there is some experiments that have been done and hives about 10 metres apart, you won't so much get issues of bees mixing from one hive to the other, which is an advantage if you don't want um, uh, diseases such as AFB or EFB to transfer from one hive to another through bee drift. Um, so really you'd have to go a lot further apart than this if you want to isolate your hives from each other. The reason why they're about this far apart is it's just a bit easier to work this hive because I can stand here or I can work this hive here. And also, if you want to hey, look in this window, there's enough room for me to look in either window. So just make sure you've got enough space to get to the side windows. Thank you very much for all your great questions. It's great to see people getting in there and answering each other's questions as well. And thank you very much for tuning in. Let us know what you'd like us to